What do all children need to be successful? They need equity. See, I learned this lesson growing up in King William County, Virginia. It was taught to me by my mother. My mother, she was the best teacher I had, even though she only had a sixth grade education the majority of her life. And I remember she taught me these lessons of equity every day growing up. She would always tell us that we could be whatever we wanted, and she always treated us with that equity and that love that we needed. But the most important lesson she taught me, I remember, was September 9th, 1993. See, we grew up in rural Virginia, in King William County, and there wasn't much to do in King William County. However, when you turned 15, you could go to the local teen club one town over. And so I remember that day, September 9th, I woke up, I pressed my cross colors outfit, and I told my brothers, I was like, I'm going to the club with you all tonight. And my brother's like, you rolling? I'm rolling. And so we went out. We were, we were headed out the door, and my mother said, hey, where you guys going? I was like, we're going to the club, Ma. And Mom said, okay, Rodney, you're not going. What do you mean? Then her voice changed, and she said it again. And at that point, I kind of realized I wasn't going to the club that night. <laughs> so I mumbled off into the room, teenage angst, you know, never let me do nothing. But then, two weeks later, my mother went out of town. So you know what I did? Woke up, pressed that outfit again, told my brothers we're going to the club. Now my brother gave me a warning. He said, you sure? I said, yeah, I'm going to the club. And so I left and we went to the club. And quite honestly, worst experience of my life. <laughs> Things were going on that I wasn't ready for. Fight broke out, I got punched in the eye. It was just an overall bad experience. And so about Wednesday of the next week, started to feel a little guilty. And so I went to Ma, who was sitting at the kitchen table, and I said, Ma, I got something to tell you. And Ma was like, I was wondering when you was to tell me about your eye, but go ahead. <laughs> and so I told her, I said, the other night, I went to the club. And then my mother just looked at me and shook her head, and she said, mm-hmm. Now, see, if you have a mother like mine, when you hear that phrase like that, you don't know whether to run, hide, call 911, or give her a hug. But my mother, she looked at me, and I was expecting to get blasted, and she told me, I'm not going to punish you because I feel you learned your lesson. And so I asked her a question. I said, Mom, why couldn't I go to the club? My brothers were 15, and they went to the club. Why wasn't I allowed to go to the club at 15? And then she gave me the piece of advice that changed my life and made me what I am today. She said, a good parent knows her children and what they're ready for and not ready for. At 15, your brothers were ready for that club environment. At 15, you need to grow and mature before you went into that environment. That's why you got punched in the eye. <laughs> but you see, that turned out to be my first lesson on equity. You know, equality said I was 15 and that I could go to this club. Equity said I need to grow and mature enough more before I could enter that environment. And see, that's what our school needs. We need equity. We need to understand that not every child in America comes to your school with the same abilities, and that we have to provide them the resources that they need to achieve, not what is equal or fair. And so there are two types of equity. The first type is ec economic equity. Economic equity is about resources, making sure kids have the resources they need when they need them to be successful. And um, when I won National Teacher of the Year, I began to tour this country, and I began to see the economic inequities that our students face. I went to one school. It was a 21st century building. The students were using robots to plant sustainable agriculture. I went 30 miles down the, school, down the road, and I went to a building that was 100 years old, no, he no heat or air conditioning, no high-speed internet, and no textbooks. How do we expect the students at the second school to compete with the students at the first school if these inequities exist? It's not fair, and therefore, we must provide economic equity to our students. The second type of equity is one that people don't like to discuss much, but that's cultural equity. It's not, 
We know 50% of the students in the United States are students of color, but 80% of the teachers in America are white. We need teachers who look like our students and who value them and the gifts they bring. All students deserve teachers, role models, nurses, paraprofessionals who look like them and value their gifts no matter their race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or citizenship status. See, a recent U.S. Department of Education survey said that when teachers of color are present, all students benefit. Teachers of color serve as role models and cultural liaisons for their students. But there's a specific benefit to ethnic and minority students. They're represented in fewer numbers in exceptional ed. There's a decrease in absenteeism. And parents and the community are more involved in schools that have teachers of color. So if we truly want to tackle the issues of the achievement gap, culturally relevant education, toxic masculinity, we need more teachers of color in the classroom. See, this is really important to students who look like me. A recent John Hopkins um, study said, student, black students who get a black teacher in elementary school are 39% less likely to drop out of high school and 19% more likely to go to college. These problems also um, excuse me, contribute to other problems we have, such as the teacher shortage. The hardest areas to staff are teachers of color. It's not a coincidence that these are the students who have the worst experience in school. No one wants to return to the scene of their trauma as a career field. We need more teachers of color in education because everybody, and I mean everybody, benefits from diversity. But also, this is really important to my students. I work at Virgie Benford Education Center, a school inside the Richmond Juvenile Jail. My students have made mistakes, and they're paying for those mistakes. But America is a country of second chances, and the best way to take advantage of a second chance is a high-quality education. My students have succumbed to the pressures of urban living, and they have made mistakes. But they persevere, and they strive for success no matter what. So I need everybody in this room to do me a favor. I want you to close your eyes. Think back to when you were a teenager. Now I'll wait, because I know some of us got to think a little longer than others. <laughs> now think of the worst thing you did during your teenage years. Now imagine if everyone knew, your teachers, principals, administrators, peers, counselors, everybody knew about your moment of weakness. Would you be where you are today? Would you have been given the opportunities that you have been given in life? My students face this every single day, yet they still persevere and fight for an education, and my job is to provide them the equitable resources they need, and I will fight to my last breath to make sure that my students have what they deserve. So I'm going to tell you a story about two of my students. First student is a young man named John. John was caught up in some gang life, some gang activities, and he came to our detention center, an extremely angry young man. I remember the first time I talked to John, his first two words with me, to me, one started with an F and the other one was you. <laughs> but I didn't take that personally, because I knew John was hurting. John had never had a positive black role model in his life. John was angry, that's why he gravitated toward the game. John had not had good experiences with schools, so he was two years behind. However, we gave John love. We showed him what he could do, and we provided him academic resources to boost his educational skills. And John graduated. Not only did John graduate, but the judge gave him special permission to walk with his graduating class at his high school along with his twin sister. It was a great moment for us. We live streamed it for the kids. It was just a really inspiring moment. However, John had four months to go before he was released and he still did not truly believe in himself. So we gave him intensive love. We mentored him. We exposed him to things that he, could, he would never have gotten exposed to. We took him into art programs. We took him on field trips. He even got a chance to go to Washington, D.C. and meet with presidential candidates Cory Booker and Kamala Harris. And it really had an effect on him. And I remember when we left that meeting, he said to me, he said, Mr. Rob, first time in my life I feel like an American. 
And so when he was released from the detention center, he went and joined the Army because of that inspiring feeling. But more importantly, he told me when he first got there about a childhood dream he had of jumping out of airplanes. And right now, he's in airborne school jumping out of airplanes. The next story is a young lady named Shamika. Shamika was caught up in sex trafficking as a means to provide for her family. You know, she was, didn't believe in herself. She had no view of herself as just an object or a toy to be used. And so she didn't believe in herself and she committed a serious assault of which she's serving three years in jail right now. However, our goal with her wasn't academic. Our goal was to get her to believe in herself. We not only provided her with academic lessons, but we just gave her love and support. We told her she was so much more than she could have ever imagined. And eventually, she began to believe in herself, and she graduated. And at her graduation, she gave us a speech. And I'll never forget this speech because it is seared into my memory. She said, I appreciate every teacher and staff that is, that's in this building. I will not only take the classroom lessons that you have taught me, but I will take the life lessons that we've had that you've taught me every day. And without a doubt, I'm going to pass it on to others. And just mark my words, one day you will hear about me. You will hear about the positive things I'm doing, and you're going to remember teaching me. Abraham Lincoln once said, the best way to predict the future is to create it for yourself. And that's what I'm going to do. So this isn't a, a graduation speech. This is more of a thank you note for what you've done for me and what I will do for the world. And so that's been ingrained in my heart. You know, and I'm getting a little choked up thinking about it. But we take the most vulnerable kids in society, and we are successful at my school. And people ask all the time, they say, what are you, why are you guys so successful with at-risk students? And I give them two responses. First thing I do is correct that question. I say there's no such thing as an at-risk student. All students are at promise and at potential if the proper supports are there and the love is there to give them what they need. But then, but then I give them some advice that I got from Hall of Fame educator Ben Talley, who lives in Bristol, Virginia. He said, there's no secret to teaching a difficult child. You just got to love them. Keep loving them. When they make mistakes, keep loving them. When they don't love themselves, just keep loving them. And see, that's what we did to, to John and Shamika. We loved them, and we made them believe in themselves. Then the second reason we are successful is it's not hard. We are fully funded school. We have equitable resources for our students. We have a 10 to 1 student to teacher ratio. We have a licensed psychologist and school counselor in the building. We have literacy and math coaches to help our students and give them the individual attention they need. But I have a question. Why does a kid have to be thrown in jail to get the resources they need to be successful? It's not right. It's not right, and it's time to call our legislators to task for these inequities. And time to ask a moral question in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. When Judgment Day comes, what is your life's blueprint when it comes to the children of America? See, I know the blueprint of every teacher I work with, because they're on the front lines every day, despite being underfunded, undersupported, and under-resourced by those who claim the value of education. We have hit a point of national emergency, and teachers are standing up, and we need people to stand up with us. And in the words of Martin Luther King, we need leaders of wise judgment and sound integrity. Leaders not in love with money, but leaders in love with humanity. Leaders not in love with saying they care about kids, but leaders who provide the resources that our kids need. We need equity in education. And so, to quote civil rights icon John Lewis, if we come together in a mission and it's grounded in love, and, and we can make the impossible possible. And so we need equity. We need equity to ensure that students suffering from multi-generational poverty in the rural mountains and the cities of Virginia receive the same education as those in Silicon Valley. We need equity to ensure that our Native American students get the resources they have been denied as the original inhabitants of this country. We need econ economic equity to make sure teachers do not have to work a second job to make ends meet. 
We need equity. And we need equity to make sure our immigrant students feel welcome and we build bridges of trust, not walls of hate. We need equity to recruit, retain, and train the best of the best for the students of the United States. And we need cultural equity to make sure our students have teachers and administrators who look like them and value what they bring to the table. So once again, I ask that question, what is your life's blueprint when it comes to the children of America? If I ask what's the evidence right now, our systems will get a giant F. And so it's time to ask yourself another question. Do we stay with the status quo or do we rise up and give our kids the equitable resources they need? Trust me, thousands of teachers, parents, students, everybody is standing up and saying enough is enough and we need leaders who are willing to stand with us. And trust me, their judgment day will not be their final day on this earth. But on election day, when millions of people led by everybody in this room go to the polls, kick down the doors, vote them out of office, and say all children deserve equity. Thank you.